It's good to be back here this morning. Good to be back with you people. You're my friends. You're my brothers, my sisters in the Lord. And uh, thank you for praying for us. Uh, and it really, every, every plane trip you take, you know, they say air travel is safer than automobile travel. Yeah, but automobile travel is not 35,000 feet above the air or above the ground. So maybe we feel a little bit more comfortable in our own vehicles, but um, God took care of us on the way out there. God took care of us in every place that we went, and God brought us back safely. And I thank God for uh, what he was able to do. Revelation chapter 7, and uh, I'm going to go through some scriptures here for you this morning, and then just sort of, I'm just going to, it's going to be a different service. I'm just going to talk about the things that I saw and the things that I was a part of uh, out in Kenya. And I promised everybody that I would, I would give a report of what I saw and what God was doing out there. And, and that's uh, what we're going to do this morning. Revelation chapter 7, I want you to look in verse 9. After this I beheld and lo a great multitude which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Now I want you to notice where these people are from. In the previous eight verses, you have a listing of the twelve tribes of Israel, and this is, in Revelation 7, God's fulfillment of everything that He promised to Israel. Uh, the dry bones prophecy of Ezekiel, this is God breathing life into those dry bones. The dry bones was the whole house of Israel. And God has once again restored life to Israel and through the 12 tribes. But now in verse 9, it's a different group. I want you to notice where they're from. Number one, nations. In the Bible, the word nations always means tribes or races. How many nations? All of them. Not just one. Amen? All of them. Kindreds means kinds of people. Kinfolk, families. People, different groups of people. And tongues, that means languages. As many languages as there are, God can save people out of them. And I want you to see that the number is a great multitude which no man could number. They stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, palms in their hands. Why the white robes? That's what they've been washed in with the blood of Jesus. The palms in their hands denote um, there was a feast day called uh, the Feast of Tabernacles. And they took palm branches and they made these little booths, these little huts out of them. And the people would dwell in those for a week while they feasted. And while they gave thanks for God. And the, the point of it was is that this represented God dwelling among his people. And so when Jesus comes riding into Jerusalem, what are they waving in the air? Palm branches. That is a prefiguring of this right here. Christ's victorious entry is always going to accompany the salvation of the Gentiles. Verse 10. They cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne, and about the elders and the four beasts, and fell down before the throne on their faces, and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing. There's seven things here. Blessing, and glory, and wisdom, and thanksgiving, and honor, and power, and might, be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. Verse 13, one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? Where'd they come from? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they, which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. I was able to share at Kilimbimbogo the teaching about your white blood cells and how they uh, are part of our salvation, how God 
takes that which is unclean that's in us, germs or bacteria or some sort of dirt in our bodies, and our white blood cells cover that completely so it's as if they're never there. Verse 15, Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple, and he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. Remember what I said. The, the palm branches denoted the Feast of Tabernacles. Tabernacles means God dwells among His people. And that's exactly what you see right there in verse 15. This is God dwelling among His people. Verse 16. They shall hunger no more. I went to a place where they know what this is about. Now maybe in days gone by, when you were growing up, your family was poor and you knew what hunger was. I didn't. My mom and dad fed me okay. In fact, they fed me well. I've been eating pretty good since I've been an adult. The only starving I've done is fasting or weight loss. But to know what starvation is like because there is no food, I don't know what that is. But I've been in a place where they know. Okay? And I'm telling you, this means a lot to them. To know that they get to go to heaven where they're not going to starve anymore. And all you have to do is set your eye on one child. Dirty, unclean. There are not very many chubby little boys and girls in Kenya. Okay? All you have to do is set your eyes on them. And it'll change you. You'll never forget it as long as you live. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. We left... Uh, Nairobi, Tuesday morning. Nairobi, it was about 60 degrees Fahrenheit. And it was overcast and rainy. And we flew to Turkana and it was 95. And no rain. It is a desert. It is very much, a, in fact, there's pictures of Turkana there. And they call it the West Texas of Kenya. Who in here has ever been to West Texas? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's a very dry, arid place. Literally, it's got sand everywhere, sand dunes. Uh, it is very, very hot there, and it stays that way year-round. And they get almost no rainwater. Uh, if it wasn't the town where our station is, is the county seat of Turkana. It's called Lodwar, L-O-D-W-A-R. And if it wasn't for the river that flows through town, I don't know where those people would get their water from, but that river is not one of those crystal clear spring-fed waters that you see around in Missouri. It looks more like the, it looks more like the Joachim, okay, than anything. And this is where they get their water from. And no, they don't filter it. They pull it out in these big gallon jugs and they carry it home. That's what they cook their rice in, that's what they drink. So it was a different world there. But in verse 17, For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne and shall feed them and shall lead them into living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Now my question is, back in verse 9, we have the multitude which no man can number of all nations, kindreds, people, and tongues. How did those people get to heaven? How did they get to be around the throne of Jesus Christ. Well, that's what we're going to look at this morning. So turn your Bible to Matthew 28. Matthew 28. That's what I have up on the screen, but I got it real little bitty, so you can't read it. Open your Bible to Matthew 28. I want you to underline these verses. This is what Jesus, the last thing he said... Uh, before the book of Acts, Matthew 28, this is the instructions that Jesus left with us, his disciples. Matthew 28, verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went away. Why is there eleven here? Because Judas 
He's already hung himself. And they have not selected a replacement for his office. They do that in Acts chapter 1. Then the eleven disciples went away unto Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Underline that phrase, all power. All power. Because if God calls it, and God ordains it, hell can't stop it. Because all power is given to Jesus to accomplish what it is that God has sent him forth to do. Did the devil try to stop Jesus from fulfilling scriptures? Yes. Was he able to? No. It's because all power has not been given to Satan. All power has been given to Jesus. And if Jesus wants it done, then it gets done. Because God has all the power to do it. If God sees fit to call a little church in Festus, Missouri, if God sees fit to call that little church to do great things for Him, then I've learned that God also is able to empower that church to do exactly what He wants done and nothing less. All power has been given unto Him. That's how these nations and Peoples and kindreds and tongues are able to stand around the throne of God and of the Lamb and worship Him for That's how God is able to dwell among those people is that Jesus has all power to accomplish His Father's will. So He says in verse 19, Go ye, because all power has been given to Jesus, go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Verse 20, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you for how long? Always. Even unto the end of the world. Amen. I was telling Michael, uh, he was taking us to the airport. And I said, Michael, I can remember our first trip to Kenya. I never wanted out of a place quicker than getting out of Kenya the first time I was there. It was a different world. It smelled. First thing, we got off the plane in Kenya for 2011. Michael said, you smell that? And I said, yeah, what is that? He said, Kenya. And apparently he had been gone long enough to where, you know how odors just get fixed in your nose, you don't smell them anymore. You don't smell your own house, right? But you go to somebody else's house and you go, oh, your house smells like this. Yours does too, you just don't remember it. Michael goes back to Kenya and he's going, oh man, Kenya, oh. Those two weeks were hard on me. There was stress getting to the country. There was stress getting out of the country. We like to never made it. Um, everything that we did that first time in Kenya, it was hard emotionally on me. It was hard physically on me. And I said to myself after that first trip, I'll never come back here ever again. And then, uh, we went back, uh, with, uh, brother Mike Hutzel ministering with him, preaching with him. And then I said, I'll never go back. And then God gave us a radio station in Samburu, Kenya. And the first time I was supposed to go out there because God had allowed us to, to drill one well in Samburu, uh, I remember walking up telling Mike and Alicia, I'm not going. I'm not going. And Alicia said, Dad, you have to go. I said, no, I don't. You can't. You're not the boss. I'm the boss. I said, I'm not going. And she said, Dad, you have to go. They're waiting on you out there. I didn't know what she meant until I got out there. And my heart just melted. And when I left Kenya the third time, I said to myself, I'll be back. And so going this time, it was without a doubt, one, one of the greatest ministry times I think in my whole life. Not the only one, but one of them. And uh, I'm not kidding you, 
uh, Thursday come around, I preached twice at Kilimanjaro, and I said to myself, I could, I could stay out here longer and preach longer. I wouldn't mind going back out to Samburu. I wouldn't mind going back out to Turkana. Uh, it's the first time I've ever said that. But it is very clear to me now that God has given this church those opportunities in that place. And I don't think God's done giving us the opportunities. I don't think he's done. I think now he's just getting started. Now, what else God has for us is not up to me. The radio stations were not up to me. I fought Michael on these, I mean, almost to fisticuffs because I didn't want to do it. And one morning, his grandmother called. His grandmother, if you've never met her, she is, the, without a doubt, the most godly woman I've ever met in my whole life. And if she said God told her something, she, God told her this. She called Michael one morning and she said, Michael, I don't know what this means, but God has showed me that he is going to bless you today and he's going to give you a tremendous blessing, something you've been waiting for for a long time. He said, okay, Grandma. He had no idea what it was. But later that day, he came upstairs and was bugging me again about starting a radio station. And I finally said, okay, leave me alone. Go start it. Just leave me out of it. I want nothing to do with it. And so I, I thought it would cost us millions of dollars, not even anywhere close. So I wanted Nairobi because there's 10 million people lives in Nairobi. And I thought, we'll get a lot of people listening. And God said, no. Actually, God said, I got something better. So... Where we got Samburu, I have no idea. Michael went one day looking for an open frequency, and they had one for sale or for rent in Samburu. It's, uh, uh, what's the name of the town? Marilal. Marilal, Samburu, Kenya. I didn't even know where it was on the map. And... He said, we got, the, we got a frequency. I said, where? At Nairobi? No. Eldoret? There's a lot of people who lives in Eldoret. I said, no. Kitali? There's a lot of people. He said, no. Marilal Samburu. I said, where in the world is that? And he showed it to me. And I went, oh. I didn't get a chance to meet the Muslim convert. He knew I was coming, and I don't know if he was afraid or what. But there's a man that lives up there that is now preaching the gospel who was converted from Islam to Christianity by our radio station. And um, once God does something, you can't stop it. And it just keeps on growing and keeps on giving. And so anyway, uh, then last year, uh, Michael brought to us the idea of starting two radio stations. I think it was about a year and a half ago. And so we decided to go ahead and do that, and God has blessed both of them. And uh, let, let me hurry up and, and go through some of this. But right up here on the screen, this is uh, Lodwar Turkana. These mountains they just kind of stick up. Uh, they just, it's almost looked like they're out of place. But here's the airstrip where we landed. Here is the town of Lodwar. And right up here, it's hard to see right here, but as soon as I got off the plane... There's this hill that overlooks the airport, and I got off the plane, and I looked up there, and it made me mad. There's a great big statue of some dead guy named Jesus up there. And the, uh, one of the guys told me, and he said every year uh, at Easter, the Roman Catholics have like a pilgrimage. They all walk up the top of that hill so they can pray to that statue. And I said, what a shame. It made me angry that it was there. And I told everybody, I said, I'm going to pray that God shakes the earth and causes that thing to come rolling down that hill. Um, the Catholic Church has a very large presence in Turkana. The Seventh-day Adventists have a very large present, up, presence up there, and they both hate me. I have spoken out publicly against their religion, and I, now that I've been there, I'm going to double down on it. And I'm not going to give it a rest. I'm not going away. They're going to try to stop us. 
But if God's in it, they're messing with fire. Because they're not really against us. They're against Jesus. When you go out against Jesus, you're asking for trouble. Amen? I'm of no consequence out there, but Jesus is everything. So that is the area of Turkana. These are the people of Turkana that you'll see walking up down. Very old school Kenya. Very old school. Um, in Nairobi, you'll see a lot of modern Western clothing, Western ways of doing things and so on. But when you get out into places like Samburu and Turkana, you're dealing with old school Kenya, including women just don't fathom wearing shirts. Places around up there. Uh, they need the gospel. Gospel, when you teach them the gospel, God will teach them how to cover themselves. And they should. And so here is uh, Lodwar Turkana on a map. This is north. This is Lake Turkana here. This is, here is uh, Lodwar where we were. Uh, here's central Kenya. Uh, Lodwar is about 1,500 feet above sea level. And I could feel it. Uh, that along with the heat, along with we got up early Tuesday morning, and by the time I was done doing Pastor Mike online, I thought I was going to have to go to the hospital, but they ain't a hospital up there, I don't think. Uh, the, the atmosphere and the heat had just about did me in. Uh, by the time we were waiting for the plane, I could barely walk. My legs were cramping real bad. I was shaking all over, uh, sweating profusely, and it was everything I could do to get on that plane. Coming back, and I equated it to whenever you serve God and you do well for God, He will let devils beat up on you. Okay, He'll let them do it. Why? Because you just did something big for God, and if we're not careful, we'll let that go to our head and we'll make ourselves big, and we're not. So, God will let you get beat up just so that you'll know that it was God doing it and not you. And that's what happened. Uh, let's see here. You can't read all of this. 15, Turkana is uh, 1,500 feet above sea level. I think Festus is only like 500 feet above sea level. So it's a difference of 1,000 feet. And it's, it makes a big difference. Here is Marilal Samburu, Kenya. This is where our, the first radio station that we built is in. Here is the station office. Uh, Watchman FM, yes, that is a picture of me up on the wall. And they had a, a TV screen that plays all these different Watchman broadcasts. And I'm going, hey, I know that. I have that same tie that guy has. Uh, it's called Watchman FM in, um, in uh, Samburu, but it's called Ek Ekoyokan. Kenya. Ekoyokan is the Turkana language for Watchman FM. The Catholic Church in Turkana has also started a Ekoyokan radio in Turkana, Kenya. Why? They want people to think that they're listening to me, but they're listening to Catholic radio. And they've done this to us in Samburu. And at every place that we own a radio station, the Catholic Church has a station with those same names on it. Okay? I call it flattery. But they do. They hate us so bad up there that they're trying to do what we're doing but draw people away from us to the Catholic faith. So I'm not going to let up on them. This is me... Doing something I swore I would never do. I am street preaching. I am not a street preacher. And that afternoon it started raining. And I said, good. I hope it comes pouring down so I won't have to go out there and preach. And so God has a funny way of doing things. It quit raining until it was my turn to preach. And then it started pouring down. There's a man standing there holding 
a, uh, an umbrella over me, but he's not doing a really good job of it. So my Bible got soaked, I got wet, and three people got saved. And it wasn't me because I was hiding under the covers. I did not want to do this. But I found myself... Now, we're in a slum in Kenya. We're in a slum in Kenya, in Nairobi. And I found myself loving those people so much as I'm preaching... I'm pointing to people as they're walking up the street, walk, trying to get past us. And I'm pointing to them, and I'm saying, young lady, please listen to me. God sent me here to warn you about going to hell. You don't want to go to hell. And I was bawling my eyes out, preaching to these people. I was calling them out, pointing to them, saying, please, don't walk past us. You need to hear the gospel. And... Um, but three people I, I hope to see in heaven one of these days because of that. This is our uh, station in, um, was it Samburu? That we won the, or Turkana, that we won the awards. Those are four trophies that we have sitting in our front office for our radio station in Turkana. In, in a year's time, we've already won four awards. It's not just some rinky-dink radio station We've done the best that we could with what God has given us to do and it's been noted and we have won four awards now in that area for having the best radio programs and the best looking speaker. <laughs> and that's me doing Pastor Mike online from uh, Turkana, Kenya. This is the office uh, in Samburu, Watchman Radio, very nice place. Uh, they're all wearing their nice, free, Think Bible hats. These are a couple of the young men that work there. This is Michael's uh, cousin, Kister, and she works at both stations. This is the uh, receptionist, I think, in Samburu. Very nice people to meet. They were excited to meet me. This is the church that I preached at a couple years ago. This is in Samburu. Uh, the Anglican Church. It was a packed house. Again, we got there late. I got to tell you this. You know, the devil fights you any way that he can. We got to the airport in uh, Nairobi to, to get, take the helicopter out to Samburu. Helicopter is supposed to leave at 8. We're supposed to get to Samburu at 9, which would have given us plenty of time to have breakfast and then be at the church early. At a quarter till 9... Our chopper pilot has not shown up. We think that the vice president of Kenya, who was there at the same time, stole our chopper and our pilot. And all of a sudden, Michael's on the phone with the company that we hired to fly us out there. And they're saying, because he's trying to call the chopper pilot, and chopper pilot's not answering his phone. And I'm sitting there going, we're not going to make it. To Samburu today. We're not going there today. And at quarter till nine, in walks a chopper pilot who was at that airport for, we have no idea why he was at that airport and he doesn't know either. And he said, Yeah, I'll fly you guys up there. Not making that up. We would have not gone there had God not sent us a Prepaid, pre planned, prefigured chopper pilot who didn't know why he was at that airport at that time. And when we got done, he flew us over the elephants and the giraffes and the zebras and the water buffaloes and the rhinoceroses and the hippopotamuses and the pink flaming pink flamingos. To us, they're just yard decorations. We saw one million pink flamingos sitting out on the lake, and when the chopper flies over, they all start flying up at a, you, you just, looks like being at a gay pride festival, just pink everywhere. <laughs> That's a bad illustration, but anyway. <laughs> I've never seen anything like that in my life. But that, that's the uh, churches, that's the church there in Samburu. Actually, it's just a representation of several of the churches that decided to have their service with us there uh, last Sunday morning. And I preached on the mediatorship of Jesus Christ, and we had an outstanding time. 
Turn your Bible to Jeremiah. I've got a lot more pictures, and I just I want to spend time in the Scripture, and I'm going to show you a couple things, and I'm going to let you go. Jeremiah chapter 1, I want you to turn there to these places and underline these in your Bible. And when you see these verses, I want you to write Bethel Church. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying... Now, none of this is a mystery to God. God knew about everything that we did last week before the foundation of the world. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Right next to that verse, Bethel Church. Now, he's speaking to Jeremiah, and I get that. At one time, Bethel Church did not exist. But she was in the womb. And then God brought this church forth. And God had it in his mind 50 years ago that he was going to call this church to be a voice to the nations. I did not see it. You know, over the years, uh, Megan, you know, we've had missionaries come here. And we've given missionaries money to go out and preach the gospel. I never... Saw myself as a missionary. I thought, I'm not cut out for it. I don't think I am. But to us, mission work was something that we pay other people to go do. But since we don't have a denomination anymore, God has just decided to make this church a missionary church. It's not done in the typical fashion where people sign up and they learn the language and they send them out there for three or four years and so on. We have a constant presence in nations around the world. Verse 6, Then said I, Ah, Lord God, I behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. Verse 7, But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Uh, verse 8, be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Look at verse 9. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. See, I have set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out, to pull down, to destroy, and to throw down, to build, and to plant. Turn to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. I'm showing you the ministry of of Bethel Church. This is what God has said to us. This is what we are. Isaiah chapter 6. And by the way, I, I do not want to exclude those of you who are watching with us regularly online. Um, God has used you to bless us here. God has used us to bless you. But through your prayers, your love for the gospel, your, um, your support, uh, just you're, you're coming here to visit us here. Everything about what you do for us is part of what we're doing. So if you're outside that camera and still consider yourself Bethel, this is for you too. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, with twain he covered his feet, with twain he did fly. One cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord host, Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. That sounds like America, doesn't it? Have you not ever gone to work in America? Brother Edward, what do people where you work sound like? Do they have unclean lips? I used to work construction. I know what people talk like. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Verse 6. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. 
Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I. Send me. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 2. Ezekiel chapter 2. Here's what I'm going to tell you on this so far. Just because you have a past does not mean God can't use you. God is able to clean us up, purge us how He wants, sanctify our lips and sanctify our testimony so that we can be... God does not call the qualified. He qualifies those whom He calls. God did not call us because we're the biggest church. We're the best church. God did not call us because we're the richest church. God did not call us because we're the best looking church. God did not call us for any reason of that. He called us because He knows He can use us. Because He knows that a church like ours won't let it go to our head about how good we are. That's why God's using us. It's just the opposite. God knows how rotten we really are. And for Him to even use us is the miracle. Ezekiel chapter 2 verse 1. He said unto me, Son of man, stand upon thy feet and I will speak unto thee. And the Spirit entered into me when he spake unto me and set me upon my feet that I heard him, him that spake unto me. And he said unto me, Son of man, I send thee to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation that have rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me even unto this day. For they are impudent children and stiff-hearted. I do send thee unto them and thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God. I'm not supposed to go over there with any other message other than thus saith the Lord God. And verse 5. And they, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are a rebellious house, yet shall know that there has been a prophet among them. And a prophet is simply one who says, thus saith the Lord. Now chapter 3. Verse 1. Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, eat that thou findest. Eat this roll and go speak unto the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he caused me to eat that roll. And he said unto me, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. Then did I eat and it was in my mouth sweet as honey for sweetness. And he said unto me, Son of man, go get thee unto the house of Israel and speak with my words unto them. Thou art not sent to a people of a strange speech and of a hard language, but to the house of Israel. Now, I'm going to throw this in. Even as far away as Lodwar Turkana is from Nairobi, most places in Kenya, they can read English. Now, they have a hard time understanding my accent, which I don't understand why. And so a lot of times they'll be an interpreter. But they can, Lisa will tell you, most of their like street signs, road signs, billboards, English. They're almost as used to reading English as we are to speaking English. King James Bible. They can read a King James Bible. And I'm not going over there with anything but a King James Bible. There is not, from what we know, there is not a Swahili, a full Swahili translation that follows the King James. Um, Bearing Precious Seed is working on one right now. They have John and Romans and they have other parts done. And they have asked that Mike Hutzel and I go through it when they get it done to make sure it's right. And I'm going, who am I? But those people can read English. Okay? So I'm not going to some place and saying you need to believe the King James when they can't understand it. They can. People on varying degrees, and I get that. But it's just like out in Goa, India, Pastor Lordson... He has an English-only service amongst those who understand English. And he has a Hindi service to those who only understand Hindi, but he's reading the King James Bible to them. And God has then given him the gift of interpretation to be able to interpret 
in their language what it is that he's reading. Okay? So, I'm not going to people who can't understand what's being read to them. They can. So he said, For thou art not sent to a people of a strange speech and of a hard language, but to the house of Israel. Not to many people of a strange speech and of a hard language, whose words thou canst not understand. Surely had I sent thee to them, they would have hearkened unto thee. But the house of Israel will not hearken, hearken unto thee, for they will not hearken unto me. For all the house of Israel are impudent and hard-hearted. Behold, I have made thy face strong against their faces, and thy forehead strong against their foreheads. And as an adamant harder than flint have I made thy forehead. Fear them not, neither be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. Now, I said I'd never street preached before. I think I had a far easier time street preaching in Kenya. And still to this day, I'm not sure that I would be able to street preach in America. Not to my own people. But God's just given me a sturdiness over there with them to be able to say what really needs to be said. And they love me for it. They appreciate it. So, uh, Revelation 10, turn there and then I'm going to say a few words. I'm going to cut you loose. Revelation 10. All of these verses now, they are, they've got Bethel Church written all over them. God has called this church... And you're a part of that. It's not just me. I wouldn't have it that way. It is us together as a church, ministering, preaching, evangelizing. There are people being saved. There are churches that are, are coming around to right doctrine. There are pastors who are learning things they've never learned before because they don't have the opportunities as pastors to learn where they are. They're just kind of stuck out there on their own. And that's a hard place to be. I, even I, was taught good things. As a child growing up here, taught some decent things at Bible college. They don't have that opportunity. So they have asked me, they have asked this church to help them in their ministry lead their people and preach to their people. I don't see how we can turn them down. Revelation 10, verse 9. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it up, take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. In verse 11, And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. That's our church. That's what God has given us. God has called this church to minister outside of the walls of this church. But I'm going to say this. A prophet is not without honor save in his own country. We've tried for years to win people in Festus and in Jefferson County. Got nowhere. So while we have not had success reaching out locally, I cannot begin to tell you the great success that we've had reaching out first all over the world with just the internet and then the area of reach that both of our radio stations are in, I'm going to say is probably close to half a million people that listen or have the potential of being reached by our radio stations. Half a million people. Okay? Joel Osteen will spend billions of dollars trying to get that kind of reach. And God's given it to us for just pennies on the dollar. Okay? So, I want to... Uh, there's going to be more coming out this week that I'm going to... I'm just going to put all the videos and the pictures together to show you what I've been doing. And to show you the impact, you're going to meet the pastors because they're in Turkana. They went around with the camera. Every pastor introduced themselves to all the other pastors in the group and to me. And we got that on film. So you'll know these men and you'll pray for them. You pray for their churches. You pray for the work that they have to do out there. I, would, I want to tell you something. 
if God asks me to move to Turkana, I'm going to have a hard time doing that. That is not my idea of heaven. Now, if he said go, I guess I would go, but I wouldn't like it at first, I guess. I would not want to move out there. But the men that are out there, I think we're to help them in every way we can. Because if you don't, God just might move you out there. Okay? Mike, God just may transfer you to Turkana, Kenya. Good luck with that. Okay? Um, I want us to stand to our feet. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm just want to close in prayer. But I want us to pray this morning. You have the scriptures there in front of you. And the scriptures that I've pulled together this morning, they all say this. God's called us to the regions beyond. But he had to first put the book in us. Or we'd have nothing to preach to him. Whatever, what, what little help they might get from the West comes in the form of purpose-driven church in your best life now. The false prophets are trying to tell these people that they'll just, they should become rich just because they got saved. That's not fair to them. Because most of these people are never going to get out of poverty until they get to heaven. But I can tell you, most of those people want heaven more than we do. Because they don't have anything else in this life. Nothing. They got nothing over there. Okay? There's all, because of that, there's always going to be a target on us. When, I, when it's on me, I'm okay with that. If I get beat up, I'm fine with that. But when I see the devil going after you guys... That bothers me. Because it's my job to try to protect you from that. And when I see the devil going after you for something that I said or did, that bothers me. And it also almost makes me want to quit so the devil will lay off you guys. I know that's not the way to do it. The way to do it is just walk up to you and kick the devil's rear end away from you. Okay, and get real mean about it and drive the devil away so that you're fine again. But we're going to go through adversities. We're going to be at each other's throats. We're going to suffer persecution. Old sins that you thought were gone are going to find their way back and you're going to have to fight them off again. That I'm telling you, the devil is going to pull out all the stops. You know what that means, don't you, Pam? When you pull out all the stops, that's an organ term. Right? Pull out all the stops. That means all the air is going to go through all of it. Okay? We're going to pull out all the, he's going to pull out all the stops and he's, got, he's not going to spare any of us to try to get us to stop doing what we're doing. Okay? And that goes for you folks online too. He'll drive some of you away. He'll create havoc in your life, in your family. Create financial hardships. He'll do everything. Um, because we are in the front line of the battlefield every day in these places. And, but if God called us to do it, he said he'd be faithful to us while we did it. Okay? Now, if this is not the church that you wanted, I can't help it. I didn't do it. This is obviously is the work of the Lord, or it wouldn't be going on. And... Um, but if you're, in for the, if you're in for it, like I am, let's join ourselves together this morning in prayer. And let's ask God to bless the work that we're doing in Kenya, India, wherever God takes this ministry, we're in for it. We're here together. Amen. And Father, we come to you. I thank you, God, for everything. God, there's not anything, Lord, that I've ever done, anything that's ever happened to me, good or bad. Because, Lord, I see it all as how you brought this thing about. And I thank you, Lord, that I have a church that's willing to be part of this with me. It's like 
me being able to share what I'm doing with my wife, that means a lot to me. And I want her to be as much a part of that as I am. And Lord, that's how I see this church. I want my church to be blessed the way I'm blessed. I want them to be as much a part of this as I am. And I wouldn't want it any other way. And Father, I just thank you, Lord, for what you've done in this place and, and with these people, what you've done in their lives, and how, Lord, you've reformed them and how you've made them and done things in their life. And now, Father, we see it being done all over the world. And these pastors, Lord, have asked me to convey their gratitude to this church, but also to convey their request for help. They weren't asking for money. God, they were asking for teaching. They were asking for Bibles. They were asking, Lord, for helping equip them to pastor, to minister, to heal sick folk, to win lost people to Jesus, to confront the false religions that are out there. God, that's what they asked me for. And Father, I pray, dear God, that you would always enable this church to do exactly that for them. I pray, dear God, that you would bless them, that you would help them, help us, dear God, to reach wherever you want us to reach. Lord, I'm sure there's a limit to what you'll have us to do, and I'm fine, Lord, as long as it's your limit. But Father, however you use this and whatever you do, Lord, we're grateful for, because God... We were people, Lord, that I didn't think, Lord, that I could ever be used again. But you saw fit, Lord, to do it. And Father, many of these, Lord, are the same way. They didn't think, God, that you could ever, ever do anything in them. And yet, here you are doing it. So, Father, help us, dear God, to be on our knees, in our Bibles, praying for one another, praying for their pastor, and praying for the work, dear God. Help us, dear God, to fight the devil every day and in every way, Lord. He may persecute us. He may beat on us. But he can't stop us. Or he would have. And so, Father, we thank you, dear God, for what you're doing. Father, we just ask that you keep doing it and that you use us to do it. Father, bless my people. Dismiss them in your care, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.